all black everything everything black culture over everything y'all we taking it back black Welcome to Left of Black, the fifth season of Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here for, at the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke University, and we're joined via Skype by President Dr. Walter Kimbrough, President of Dillard University, the seventh President of Dillard University, former President of Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas. How are you doing today, Dr. Kimbrough? I'm doing really good, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. We've actually wanted to have you on for a long time. Uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting about your profile, I mean, if folks want to follow you on Twitter, they follow you at Hip Hop Prez. Um, you know, that speaks to a couple of things. Uh, one, about your age, the generation that you come from, but also from the standpoint that, you know, you have had a kind of investment uh, in young folks, in young folks' culture, and, and, and hip hop is kind of a, an extension of that. Um, talk a little bit, if you can, about what it's been like for you. You know, you even now are one of the youngest college presidents in the country. Definitely was the case when you were president for Landis Smith. You know, what does it mean for you to bring hip hop, you know, into the academy, uh, particularly from the administrative standpoint, the way that you have thus far? Right. Well, you know, when I became president of Philander Smith, I was 37. Uh, <laughs> at the time, the average age of college presidents was 58. So when I'm being introduced, <laughs> there's no way you can really come out and just, you know, try to sound like the regular college president. It would have been completely <laughs> inauthentic. And so I acknowledged, you know, that day I said, look, you know, I'm from Generation X, you know, and this is what people thought about the Xers, but that's who I am. I'm also from the hip hop generation. And so there is a different sensibility that I bring to the job. So I have to be who I am and be authentic yeah. in the work that I do. And so one of the local papers in Little Rock came up with this whole hip hop president thing. I didn't create it. I just said this is from the generation. But once it came out like that, I was like, okay, that's cool. I can go with that. And so it's just sort of been, you know, it's just a reflection and particularly, I guess it pushed back on people because a lot of people when they were thinking about hip hop, you know, they're thinking about the commercialized product that really is just overly mm -hmm. sexist, misogynistic, violent. And I'm like, I went to school where I'm hearing KRS One, Public Enemy, so I'm <laughs> I'm hearing, uh, you know, the variety. I heard Two Live Crew too. Okay, but you got the broad <laughs> spectrum of hip hop that was informative for me as a black student at the University of Georgia that was still within the first 25 years of black folks being on that campus. So. That music spoke to me with some of the experiences I had and people of my generation at predominantly white institutions during that time. And so it's just who I am and, and just being authentic in that, I think, reaches out to students and um, just a broader connection. So, it, I, you know, it, it works for me. So I just I keep doing it. My wife says I have to give it up when I'm 50. So I got three years <laughs> left. So we'll see what happens after that. But yeah, it, it's, it's been good. You know, one of the things that, that's interesting about the work you're doing now, um, because you're kind of at the forefront of what are continuous efforts to rebrand historically black colleges and universities. Um, you know, everyone is struggling to be able to reach, and you know, not just in terms of HBCUs, but you know, what so many young folks are seeing college as not necessarily their only option after high school. We have so many examples of folks who have become successful without having to choose a college education. You know, so colleges and universities are in competition for the attentions of young folks. And, and, and of course, that's also the case for HBCUs. What are some of the challenges that you're facing these days, you know, trying to present HBCUs, in your case, Dillard in particular, you know, as, a, as an obvious choice for many, not just even African-American students, but for students who are looking for quality higher education? Right. Well, you know, I think the, the challenge is some of the numbers, I think, are skewed. And so people say, well, there are fewer students at HBCUs percentage wise, but there has been a gradual increase in the number of students going to HBCU. So we have a, a larger college going population, a larger in a country. So the overall numbers have increased. The percentage goes down. And so you want to make sure. And the thing I always tell students when I'm recruiting students is go to the place that's the best fit for you. Yeah. And a lot of times, particularly for black students, they'll go to big state university because they're caught up in the athletics and all of that. And they have right. a horrible experience. Like I said, I can speak to that because I went to Georgia. So, I mean, that's the <laughs> First time I ever heard somebody call me a nigger and it wasn't like a part of a song that was cool, I was at Georgia and I was like, oh, this is some, you know, because I went to all black schools in Atlanta, you know, so that was, 
And so people are still having those same experiences today. The number of racial incidents on these campuses blows my mind. And so I tell students, if, if you're good with that and you're going to be successful, for me, it's more important to have more black folks with degrees. And so if you don't go to an HBCU, I'm OK with that because I didn't either. But for a lot of students, they need that kind of environment where, you know, the faculty going to know you, the president's going to be in your business, have your cell phone number, because that's some things that they miss as a part of growing up that they really could benefit from that. And so that's what I sell to say, this is the niche that we feel. It doesn't, we don't have to be, and I mean, you know, Dillard, we have about 1,200 students. Max for us is 16 to 1,800, because I think what we do has to be done on a personal level. So I can't get caught up in these huge economies of scale, say I gotta have more people, and people say, well, what's your enrollment like? Well, I want our enrollment to grow some, but I want a quality, high-touch environment that's gonna help those students, because I still, I'm like 80% Pell Grant eligible this year, which just blows my mind. So I have a lot of low-income students that have a lot of other challenges that I have to pay attention to. And so just having a lot of students doesn't do any good if I let those students fall through the cracks. So that's the kind of message that I think HBCUs have to really get out to say, this is what we will provide. It doesn't mean we have to be the biggest, but a high quality education, the students graduate, uh, and particularly for our population, we have a high needs population, particularly on the finances side, because that's where everybody's struggling, that students are just having problems paying their bills. So. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Dr. Walter M. Kimbrough, who's the seventh president of Dillard University in New Orleans. You know, Walter, you just mentioned some of dealing with student populations that are dealing with certain kinds of challenges. Um, you know, it's not just about what they're doing in the classroom, but they're dealing with a myriad of other circumstances that they're trying to manage. And probably even worse so, you know, if they are living or they, if they're from New Orleans, right, and trying, you know, to do the college thing and still being pulled back, you know, in certain kind of ways with community and family and what have you. You know, with that in mind, you look at a city like New Orleans and what we saw go down in Ferguson, you know, this, that's not an unusual circumstance, if you will, in terms of the relationship between, you know, black folks and law enforcement in New Orleans and what we saw go down in Ferguson. You know, what were some of the things that you had to deal with, you know, trying to incorporate what was happening in Ferguson in very productive ways with the population that you're dealing with, you know, down in, in Dillard, and particularly given your own research around the lives of African-American men, you know, what were some of the challenges you had to face in terms of addressing the larger questions of Ferguson, you know, to the very specific realities taking place in New Orleans and at, at Dillard University? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, New Orleans has had a, a history of some atrocities, particularly around Katrina, where you had black men who were being shot by right. police right. right after that. And so that's still fresh on people's minds. And, you know, are there, is there still issues of justice? Now, some of those officers were black, too. So I think the issue here in New Orleans has been there's been corruption and wrongdoing by police, right. regardless of race. Right. It's not as simple as right. white officers, black folks, it's Absolutely. officers and black folks. Right. Um, but I think the thing that I've seen since I've been here and I credit the, the mayor with really stepping up to do some different things we have and it was interesting because when all the stuff was going down in Ferguson the chief of police in New Orleans resigned sort of on the low like man they might come look at me next I'm about to be shot all out. It, was, it was funny to me because I was like okay so the, the guy in Ferguson is still in place but the dude in New Orleans says I'm about to get out of here right. and so the interim chief uh, African American man he's an ordained preacher he's I mean just seems like a really good dude but we're going to do something with St. Aug High School, which is a Catholic all boys high school here uh, in about a month, where we're gonna do a, a summit for black men and talk about to understand what are your rights to, you know, under, so it's not just, these are the things you have to do to, you know, not get in trouble with the law, but you, these are things you need to know when your rights are being violated. So we wanna present the entire spectrum for them working with the police um, to create those kind of partnerships. And so we keep that on the minds of our students here, but it is something in the community and because of some of the past atrocities here, there already is, um, a way to uh, monitor the progress of the p police. There's an African-American woman who is a civil rights attorney who was hired recently that will do some of that monitoring. So we already have a system in place here to do what they need to do in Ferguson. It's the same kind of thing, but the city of New Orleans has that because we've had problems in the past and we've had the Justice Department come in and give us things to do. So it becomes a great, and we're still doing some additional learning experiences because of Ferguson, because New Orleans, like you said, we've dealt with some of this and we're still going through it, but I think we're moving in the right direction as a city. You mentioned one of the other significant challenges, that being the economic challenge of being able to afford college. 
you know, that's always been the case for poor working class folks. It seems even much more of a crisis now in an environment where we're seeing high unemployment rates. You know, we're seeing black communities that have not recovered from the black, you know, from the Great Recession back in 2008, 2009. And in some ways, going to college almost seems like a luxury to some of those populations. And so, you know, many institutions, I mean, even someplace like like Duke, you know, they're in you know, high modes, you know, in terms of trying to deal with issues of fundraising, what have you, trying to engage philanthropy. You know, HBCUs for a long time, of course, have had to survive on philanthropic efforts, right? You know, folks being willing to give to those schools, to give back to those schools. And, and you were very critical a year ago, you know, when the word came out about Andre Young, AKA Dr. Dre, and the huge gift, you know, that he gave the University of Southern California. And, and just raising a general question, not even just as a, simply a critique of Dr. Dre, but you know, are figures like a Dr. Dre or Sean Carter or Beyonce Carter Knowles, you know, however we choose to, you know, to think of them, are they going to be willing and committed to be able to provide financial support for these institutes, institutions that, quite frankly, are not just you know, American national treasures, or not just African American national treasures, but really American national treasures. When you consider all the minds that have come through these institutions, right? Yeah, I mean that becomes one of our our challenges. And, it's, and I look at it on two fronts because I always start with those who are alums. It is your responsibility primarily to take care of those institutions. Right, I'm, right after right. Katrina, um, Dillard had their commencement later because of the storm, um, and Bill Cosby spoke. And I actually came to that because they did the president's inauguration. So it was July of 2006. And in his speech, you know, people say, oh, Bill Cosby's coming, and they're expecting Bill Cosby to just, like, dump all this money. <laughs> but in the speech, he kept saying, like, this is your guard. He kept saying it, and it was very powerful to me because he was reminding people to say, no, you guys have to take care of This is your school. And so there is some level of let's really step up and we might not have a lot of, you know, wealthy people, but collectively, if people really give give their money, we can do a lot with that. And then we should be able to leverage that with some of those folks out there to really buy into philanthropy. Because my issue and I always some people got on me, for, you know, with the doctors. I was like, look, I say this dude's money. He can do whatever he, he wants, wants to. It's right. his money. But I'm saying, Dr. Dre, their their endowment is twice as much as the endowment of all the HBCUs put okay, together, right, okay? Right, right. They all need the money. The, it costs almost 50 grand a year. Some people call it the universe of spoiled children. You're gonna take <laughs> your 35 and match it with a 35 from Steve, uh, from Jimmy Iovine. Uh, they don't really need it. It's your money. I mean, so I was like, even if he gave it to Compton Community College, I would have been cool with that because that's where he's from. That's gonna help a diversity of people. But given the money to USC, a place has also seen as numbers of black students decline, where they've had racial incidents with the police and black students. So I'm sure the students were singing after police at USC when he was giving them $35 million. <laughs> right. That's just the irony of the thing for me. So I'm just like, we got to just say, how can you, what's going to be a transformational gift? Because giving them that money is nothing. It's a chip. You give me $35 million, I put that into an endowment, and I can pay tuition and fees for a whole lot of people forever. And it becomes transformational because for those students, you're not just transforming their lives, you're changing generations yeah. of people. And that's what we've got to really work on, that message. I don't think we've done a good job, but we've got to keep giving that message that this is a truly, a, a true opportunity for transformation. Now, you know, when you think about, you know, HBCUs, though, Walter, I mean, and, and I think about your presidency, and, and you represent a certain, obviously, a generational mode, but your relationship to hip hop is very different than most of your peers, you know, who are leading HBCUs. And, and as you well know, you know, there's a long history of tension between HBCUs and what folks thought of as hip hop. Right. Um, you know, 20 years ago, not only would folks be complaining that Dr. Dre, you know, gave that money, you know, to USC, they wouldn't have wanted it if he had, you know, yeah, given yeah. that money to USC. You know, so how do we work through these kind of also tensions, you know, some of which is disinformation, misinformation, distrust about where hip hop is. I mean, I think one of the most compelling things about this particular moment, and you're representative of this, 
you know, you have all these folks who came of age in the 80s and the 90s listening to hip hop. These folks are college professors, they're MDs, they're lawyers, they're working in the Justice Department, they're running institutions, and yet we continue to think about hip hop in, as if it's almost infantilized, right? As, as, as if it's simply the music and the culture of 17 year olds as opposed to the kind of really cultural dynamic that it is at this point in time. Right. Well, you know, I. I mean, I, I think HBCUs have been conservative institutions. So that's just part of it. I mean, in a lot of ways, black folks are conservative too, but HBCUs are ultra conservative where we get caught up in the dress code, don't wear your hat inside. It's like, okay, I understand some of that to a degree, but I'm more interested in all what's going on inside his head than what's on it, you know? And so that's just a different mindset, but you're seeing a generational change now, um, you know, since I've been president, I think the number of presidents my age or younger, that number has exploded. It's like everybody, when they pick somebody new, and it, at one point I was sort of hesitant to say, well, it's provided opportunities, you know, like I said, being 37 in 2004 just shocked a lot of people. But now there are a lot of people coming through, and I had a president at Lincoln in Missouri was like, no, people talked about it. They were watching saying, we need to see how he does, because if he does well, there's going to be opportunities for other people. And now most of the time when I see people, I'm seeing 30 and 40 something year olds who are from the same generation that are leading these institutions. And so now we're going to start embracing. Uh, but once again, it's like HBCUs have some of the, you know, offer the fewest courses that link to hip hop. I'm doing a philosophy course this, this semester on sex, gender and ethical behavior, um, doing it with MC Light. So she's going to be in town next week. So we've been working on it during the summer. I got different artists because there's a lot of conversation that you can have about right. Right. these issues. You know, I'm on a campus that's 72 percent female. Uh, I'm bringing Luther Campbell from the two live crew because they were the first people to push that envelope about sex and gender right. and right. freedom of speech. Right. And, and then now we got the Ray Rice thing going on. So how do we link out? There's these are great learning opportunities for critical thinking. So hip hop can be a tool to have conversations because I got my students hooked into music. Now, how do we have a deeper conversation about what this means? And then how do we behave? you know and what what are the right decisions for us to make as communities and as leaders and those kind of things so i think more and more people now will accept that and so we still have to keep pushing because you still got some of the old school folks that you like and you know <laughs> i don't want to hear about dr dre and nwa and all of that and it's just an opportunity to connect and it's an opportunity for learning and so i think that's starting to change We've been talking with Dr. Walter M. Kimbrough, who is the seventh president of Dillard University in New Orleans, former president of Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas. And so one of your predecessors at uh, Dillard, of course, is the great Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook, um, who, of course, has connections here at Duke. And he was yeah. the first you know, regular rank African-American faculty hired here at Duke, and in fact, at any predominantly white institution in the South. Um, Talk a little bit about what it means. I mean, because you're only talking about seven presidents for an institution. Um, you know, you posted on your blog, for instance, that recently, you know, Dr. Norman Francis is, is finally retiring. Well, not finally, but retiring from Xavier. I mean, he's been in that position since 1968. Right. Um, you know, what kind of challenges have you faced in what has been a relatively small number of people who have led an institution like Dillard as you're trying to transform it and prepare it for the 21st century? Well, you know, it's, I mean, for me, I, I really am a student of history, and I've looked at a lot of things that Dillard presidents have done, and so for me, I don't see it as very different. I think you're just doing it in a, you know, 21st century hip-hop generation style. So some of the same, you know, values and things that you want to communicate, I'm just doing them in the, the same kind of vein. So, I mean, Dr. Cook is someone that I know, um, and then, let's see, I would have so he would be someone, I know Dr. Lomax well because he's president of UNCF yeah, and then right. Dr. Hughes. So at least three of the Dillard presidents before me, I, I knew. Uh, I always tell people my model president is Benjamin Mays, who was president of Morehouse, no, right. Atlanta, where I'm from, um, because the things that he did and how he interacted with students like a Dr. King is exactly what I try to do. It's just I'm doing it in a 21st century way, but it's the same thing. I mean, I studied what that guy did and I was like, that's how you become a president. And I think people don't see that. But that's, I mean, Dr. Mays is my model. And so you see those kinds of things. You see the, the lessons and the values that, that Cook had and uh, even his predecessor here, um, Albert W. Denton, who was president here for over 20 years. You, you learn those things. And even somebody like Dr. Francis, which is interesting because I tell people I've, I've known him for over a decade, but the last couple of years we've had a chance to really sort of hang out and just watching him, you know, 
do those things, it's like, this dude's on something else. People don't really appreciate it, but I see really and how he can still remain relevant to people. I mean, he's 83, 84 yeah, years old, yeah. but how he operates and he, and then for him to be able to take the time and just sit down and say, I'm going to explain this to you. And so for me, I'm soaking it all in because he just has so much he can teach me. But anytime I call, I'm like, hey, can you tell me about this? I mean, my main thing coming here was hurricanes. I don't know anything about hurricanes. <laughs> and we talked for two hours about hurricanes and New Orleans politics. And he was like, look, and we can meet once a month. I was like, you don't have time to do all okay. that. Just, you okay. know, we good. But so there's a lot of lessons that I learned from some of those, I think, legendary presidents that are, I think are very instructive for me. How important has social media been to you? I mean, because you're all up embedded in Twitter and things like that. Yeah. And again, that's not one thing that we think about that would be something that any college or university president would be deeply engaged in. And how difficult is it, even, is it to get our faculty colleagues to think about the importance of social media? So talk a little bit about why so, so, social media has been so important for you in that yeah. regard. And you know, it's interesting because I sort of, my presidency, <laughs> happened when social media came of age. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. during my presidency, we saw the advent of, you know, well, Facebook had started right before that, but Twitter and Instagram and all this other stuff, that stuff evolved since I've been a president. And so I've been able to just sort of get on as it developed. Uh, and it's just been for me as president of a small institution, it is the most cost effective way of yeah. getting your message yeah. out. If you learn how to use social media well, I mean, you can get all kinds of things. And so, you know, there are lots of folks at big schools with big budgets and they haven't been on, you know, shows like this or, you know, cable news shows because I'm able to get that message out because I'm interacting with people and engaging people via social media. So, I mean, I think it's great because it really helps tell the story of the institution. It brings more eyes to what you're doing. Um, and so, I, I mean, it's, you know, I, I mean, it gets me in trouble at the house, though, because if the phone's on the table and we're trying to eat dinner, I get fussed at. So that's the only thing. That's why every year around Lent, I have to give it up for that period of time so I can stay in my house. Uh, but other than that, man, it's, it's, I mean, it is the equalizer. And that's the way I look at it. it. And it's been just really been a way to sort of leverage. So, I'm, you know, for example, I'm watching VH1's um, um, documentary about uh, hip hop in Atlanta. And so I'm watching it. I had just come speaking with the National Baptist. I'm watching this. And then, you know, I'm watching Killer Mike and some things. And so we start engaging some things on Twitter. And now we set up a time for him to come out here to speak. Right. I mean, that happened on social right. media. Right. That's, right. I mean, in right. a space of half an hour, I'm connecting with Killer Mike, found out he went to my rival high school in Atlanta. All this is happening via Twitter. <laughs> and so it's, I mean, that's, to me, it's a, it's, I always tell my students, Twitter is not a toy, it's a tool. It's a yeah, great way to right. connect. Right. And when you're a small institution, I got a way to connect with somebody that I might not have been able to connect with before. It's, I mean, it's great. I'm sold. You've been watching Left of Black. We've been joined today by President Walter M. Kimbrough, president of Dillard University, the seventh president former president of Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Walter Kimball. All right, anytime. This is great. Thank you. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything. Everything black. Culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back. Black.